All right, thank you. So first, let me thank uh, the all organizers for setting up this amazing workshop and allowing me to be here. Uh, so as, you know, if you check the uh, the program, you know, you may notice I've changed the title of my talk. Actually, I, I understood, uh, I think Kevin Murphy gave a talk where he said uh, there was some rebranding of some names, like Google Research became Google AI, so I thought maybe I should rebrand my talk too, and so uh, have a more, um, maybe, title more compatible with the topic of, uh, of the workshop. Uh, I suspect perm 2 vec may directly uh, make think of some things, like, uh, you know, people use 2 vec for many things. So anybody has some idea of what perm 2 vec is about? <laughs> What is a perm? So, permutation. permutation, right? So, so this talk is going to be about permutations. And let me just to it's, it's just clarify what what is a permutation before I, I start. Permutation is just a way to reorder. It's, it's just a, a rank a, a ranking list, right? So, uh, what will be my my central object here is suppose you have basically one way to to think of them is you have items, and you have ranks. And so a permutation is just a way to assign ranks to items, right? So for example, if I call my items one, two, three, four, five, a permutation is just a way to say which, which one is the first, I mean the prefer, think of it as a rank, as a preference list, like I prefer number three, so I put one, then I prefer number one, so I, I put two, then I prefer number five, so I put three, one, two, three, maybe have four is four, and five. Okay, this is a basic object, which is what I call a permutation. So you will see it's just a bijection from 1.5 to 1.5. Okay, and so the talk is going to be about uh, how to do machine learning with these kinds of objects. Uh, but first, let me justify why it could be interesting, because maybe it's not interesting at all. So in fact, there are quite a few data which, uh, which are permutations. Uh, I must say myself, most of my applications are in life sciences, genomics. Uh, I will not talk about genomics, but there are plenty of uh, rankings there. I will try to explain where. But let's take uh, uh, data which are easy to understand. So first, you know, I gave an example here of ranking preferences of items. Uh, sometimes we collect such data. Like if you, if you do wine testing, and for wine lovers, you may notice that this picture um, contains good wines. Uh, so you may ask people, okay, you taste uh, these five uh, bottles of wine and you rank them from the one you prefer to the, the one you, you dislike most. And then each person ends up with a ranking. And then you may want to learn something for each person. Like, based on these preferences, can you predict something? Uh, so these are like data which are explicitly rankings. And obviously you need a tool uh, to manipulate this data if you want to do machine learning with them. Now there are other other cases where maybe ranks are hidden in some data, and this is where, uh, you know, myself, where I came from. Uh, I, I talked of genomics, but I will take an example of, of images. Um, if you take the images on the, on the bottom of this, of this uh, picture, you have two images, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, the, the left one would be like the, the original one, and the right one is obtained by a standard modification, normalization, uh, called in this case histogram equalization. Uh, which, which is one way to process images. So I'm not an image processing person, but at least I know this is one way to process images. And, and the normalization is very simple. It just amounts to take the histograms of colors, or here of gray values, and enforcing the histogram to be flat, uniform. Right? So the way it works is you take an image on the left, look at all the pixels, and you change the gray level of each pixel so that after if you do that on the right on the right hand side, you get a new image where if you plot a histogram of values, it's more or less uniform. And it turns out that if you do that, visually at least, it's a way to reveal some contrast, etc. Okay, but so what's the link with permutation here? Well, when you think of it, the operation of normalization here is you take an image, you look at the pixels, and what you do basically is you rank the pixels by decreasing intensity, and you change the values and the value given to a new pixel is just based on its rank, right? So in other words, the, the information you, you, you extract from the original image is not the gray levels, because the gray levels are changed. The only information you keep from the original image is the rank of the, of the pixels, right? So it's not, it's not presented this way, but you could think of the uh, histogramic organization as first taking an image, transform it, transforming it to a permutation, like this would be the ranking of all the pixels, and then doing something where each pixel 
uh, is given a gray value based on its, on its rank. Okay, so uh, in a more abstract level, you could say an image now is a permutation, and then maybe I can do histogram equalization, or maybe I could directly try to do machine learning on the permutation itself, instead of doing this uh, transformation back to an image. All right, so this is the, the motivation. I, I would say in genomics, this is also uh, what we observe. So in genomics, it's harder to show, but uh, in genomics and other fields, there is something called quantile normalization, which does exactly that. And it's used all the time when you have measures with strong batch effects or, or you know, variations, uh, like the equivalent of variations between uh, dark and, and light images. It happens in other fields. And so this quantile normalization idea is very common to say you have measures and you you forget about the values that you, you observe, you just, uh, from the measure, extract a permutation. And then from the permutation, you may uh, change the values based on a target distribution that could be uniform, or it could be something else. All right, so, so mathematically, what's the object we're dealing with? I already drew it on the board. The permutation is basically just a function from one n to one n, a bijection, so n would be the number of items could be number of pixels, could be number of bottles of wine, etc. Uh, and so uh, as soon as you start playing with permutations, uh, you may be aware that when you have permutations, uh, the set of permutations, of course, is finite. You know, if you consider all ways to rank five bottles of wine, you, you end up with a finite list. And so this list of uh, permutation as an as a algebraic structure is just a group. So a group is that when you have two permutations, you can compose two permutations by just you know, mathematically do a first ranking and then applying a ranking to this rank, you obtain a composition. Uh, and so it has a structure of group called, a, and it's called a symmetry group, which is well-studied object. Uh, I think is the first, one of the first group you, you hear about if you take uh, some, some courses on algebra. So what would, you, what would we like to do? Or at least what I will try to discuss in this talk is how to do machine learning on the symmetry group, meaning how to do machine learning where the data are permutations it would be the x values of permutations in this case. And so how to do that? Well, you know, it's a finite set, so doing learning on a finite set, you need to impose a structure. And one way to, to do that, especially if you do linear models or deep learning models, is first to convert your permutations to a vector space, saying that I will represent this permutation by a vector and all permutations by vectors. And then once I have a vector, I will do some linear algebra maybe combined with nonlinear functions, but at least use uh, uh, numerical methods based on inner products, etc. Okay, so mathematically, uh, this is what I call perm to vec. The question will be how to embed the symmetry group to a vector space. In other words, how to, to design a function phi that would transform any permutation, like this one, to a vector of some dimension, so that this could be the input of some learning that, that all of us know how to do. Uh, one thing I will, I will uh, insist on is that when you do that, you, uh, of course, there are many ways to, to, to design uh, such, such embedding, so we need to, to think about what would be a good embedding. Uh, one thing that we would like probably to impose, at least in the applications I have in mind, is a property called um, right invariance, uh, in the sense that you see here there is a, a permutation is just a mathematical function, but here I started from a list of five bottles of wines, which I call one, two, three, four, five. Right, and, and obtain a, a permutation. Now, if I decide to rename the bottles of wine differently, saying that the, the, the Bourgogne would be number one and not number four, then I obtain a different function, different permutation, but it represents the same preference. So what I would like is my mapping to be somehow invariant to that, but invariant means that if I have like two persons which rank the same items, I want that when, I, so each of them would be a permutation, so each of them would be mapped to some vector. Of course, if I change the list of bottles here, the vectors have to change, otherwise my, you know, my, my mapping would be invariant to everything, it would not change. So I want my mapping to depend on the permutation, but I want what, what I would like to want is that if I change the way to order the, the items, then the relative positions of two permutations should not change, right? So that if I learn according to one item, I would obtain the same classifier as if I learned from a different starting rank uh, definition of my items, okay? So if you translate that mathematically, it simply means that, for example, in terms of inner products, you want your matrix you know, to change globally if you rename the items. So this would translate into the fact that 
if you take the inner product between phi of two permutations, this inner product should not change if you compose on the right the permutations by any given permutation pi. And a pi would be a renaming of the items, right? So this thing is called right invariance. It's not the same as left invariance, but here we focus on right invariance, which corresponds to invariance of the geometry of the embedding if we rename just the items, which is something we, you know, we want to be able to do. Right, so we will discuss how to, um, you know, how to make right invariant embedding. Uh, and so here I also introduce the notion of kernel. You know, when you have an embedding, you also have, you can call kernel the inner product of the embedding. So equivalently, how to make a kernel which is right invariant or an embedding which is right invariant. Okay, so there are many ways to do it. I will just discuss two of them. And, and so uh, they will be related to things which were in my original title, like Quentin supervised quantile normalization, and I will also talk a bit of Kendall and weighted Kendall uh, tau. So basically, I will discuss two embeddings. Uh, there are many more, but these, these are like things, maybe topic for discussions. So the first embedding, to justify it, let's go back to this uh, example of the image. Right? I, I said wh when you do uh, this normalization of images, you have an image, then you rank the pixels, and then from this permutation, you create a new image which typically is the one you put, you know, as input to your neural network. So this is one way to, uh, you know, to embed a permutation to a vector, right? You have a permutation of pixels, and you create a vector, which is, in this case, an image. And so you think of it, this is a particular way to, to map permutation to vectors by just saying, I decide of what I call the target quantile, so it's just a vector f, which would be of dimension n, where n is the number of items. In the case of you know, of these images, uh, this would be the quantile function of the uniform distribution. And then, when you have a permutation, uh, sigma, you define uh, an embedding, so mapping phi of sigma, which is a vector of dimension n, where you just say that the ith coordinate of this permutation is your target quantile at position sigma of i. Right, so this, this is a, a just a mathematical way to say when I my, my ranking of pixels, I rank my pixels, and then I assign, let's say, to number one, the first value of f. Then to the number two, the second value of f, etc. And so this is uh, what we do when we do this image normalization. So this is an embedding that transforms permutation to vector. And we can use that. Okay? So basically, it keeps the order of your, of your pixels, but you change the values, and the values are defined by this target uh, quantile f. Right, so this is a possible uh, embedding, but you know, uh, even that you, you may you may ask, uh, uh, do we have to impose that the pixels have a uniform distribution after normalization, or maybe we should impose something else? Like uh, in in genomic data, is usually we don't focus on a uniform distribution, but we focus on a Gaussian distribution. It's called Gaussianization of data, or we focus on, on some empirical. Uh, distribution, etc. So there is a question which is that as soon as you have a target quantile f, this defines an embedding, but maybe this embedding could be optimized, you know, in the sense, so it becomes a bit similar to war to vec etc., where you define a class of embeddings and you ask the question, maybe it can be parameterized and optimized for some tasks. So maybe you can do the same and say, instead of fixing a uniform distribution on the gray values, what about seeing that as a parameter and potentially try to optimize that? Right, so this is what, uh, what we proposed last year with uh, 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 Marine Lemovor, student of mine. Uh, and, this, and this was the original title of the talk. Uh, we call that Suquan, Supervised Quantile Normalization. So it's just, you know, I write the equations, but it's just implementing the idea that instead of fixing the target quantile and then training a model, maybe you can see this target quantile as a parameter and optimize over it. So here I write the equations just in the case of a linear model, but this is you know, more generic framework, where typically what we do in, in, in genomics or sometimes image processing is first we fix a target quantile f, then we quantile normalize or histogram normalize all data. So we replace each sigma by phi f of sigma, and then we train a model. And here I write the training of a linear model that would be minimizing some empirical loss uh, over some training example. Okay? Uh, Sukwan is just the idea that instead of just optimizing the linear model or your deep learning or whatever, you may potentially add in the optimization the function f, which is the target quantile. 
So the difference between the two equations is just uh, in the uh, parameters to be optimized, I add f as a parameter and say maybe f can be jointly optimized to solve some learning problem. Right? Um, I, I will not talk about the additional omega that you see. These are regularizers, so probably you know, if you optimize, you need to regularize, but this, can be, uh, this is open to many uh, possibilities. All right, so how do we do that in practice? Well, if you want to implement that, for example, at minimum, you need to be able to compute the gradient with respect to f, etc. So let's try to work that out, and it's, it will illustrate something th that we do uh, in this case. So the question is, how does, you know, an inner product between w and phi f of sigma depend on f, right? Uh, it's not very complicated to do, and in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to write phi f of sigma. So phi f of sigma is the vector that represents permutation sigma. And you know, I said that the, the definition was the ith coordinate of phi f of sigma was the sigma of i's coordinate of f. So this can be translated mathematically by writing that the, the, the vector corresponding to sigma is just a permutation matrix, pi sigma, multiplied by f. And so pi sigma is just this matrix that you see here. It's a binary matrix whose entries are zeros or ones. And so it's one if and only if, so it's one at coordinate i, j, if and only if sigma of j is equal to i, right? I don't want to lose you in the details, so I, need, I decide to, to, to write, to define pi this way and to use pi transpose here. It's just because this pi is well known in <coughs> group theory. It's called the, the permutation representation of the group. I will not talk more about that, but it's a classical object. And so here, the tr you can see the transformation from sigma to, you know, phi f of sigma, so the, the vector that represents sigma, as just multiplying your target f by pi sigma. And pi sigma is what depends on sigma, right? So in other words, when you do this transformation, you can think of it as transforming your permutation into this binary matrix. And then this is your matrix that represents your data. And multiplication by f gives you the new normalized data. So interestingly, if you just plug that back into our um, equation, so here it's a linear model, uh, where we multiplied a candidate vector of weight w by the transform data, then you can replace phi f of sigma by pi sigma transpose f, because I just showed it was equal. And this can be just rewritten as some inner product between matrices. So it's called the Frobenius inner, inner product, but it's just inner product when you see matrices as big vectors between pi sigma, which was this binary representation of sigma, and a particular matrix, which is f w transpose. So again, here f is typically interpreted as the quantile of your data after normalization, and w is the linear, is, are the weights of the linear model. Okay, but so when you rewrite it this way, and you say maybe we should optimize f, then you see there's a complete symmetry between f and w, and you could just see them as defining a matrix of rank one, that is applied, so it becomes a linear model of our matrices where you have re replaced your sigma, so your function sigma, by this binary matrix, and then you apply a linear model on that, and optimizing W and F means optimizing the linear model under the constraint that is of rank one. Okay, so it means that uh, conceptually it's possible to optimize the target distribution in, in quantile normalization, and this can be interpreted as just representing, now you can think of it in representation, as representing a permutation as this big matrix in the permutation representation language, and applying a linear model there. Okay? Uh, how to do that in practice? You can imagine many ways. Uh, you could directly you know, derive the gradient and do some, so it's a non-convex problem because it's, you optimize over rank one matrices now, when you optimize over F and W, but you could think of directly doing some gradient descent or what we did is alternate optimization in F and W because this problem has a particular structure which is that if you fix F and optimize W, it's a simple linear problem. It's the same in the other way, just because when you think of it, you know, multiplication pi times F or pi transpose times W is a linear time operation. It's just reordering the, uh, the, the, the coordinates, okay? So there are computational tricks which maybe uh, suggest that alternating optimization All right, so, so um, 
I don't have big results to show, but this can be implemented. We tried that and we observed. Uh, for example, we tried on, on, on CIFAR, but just using a linear model on images, which is not very smart, but just to visualize what types of normalization it does. Uh, doing that helps to improve a bit about uh, compared to just doing, let's say, the uniform normalization, if you optimize this. And just to illustrate, because it is, it's visual, what kind of quantiles are learned. So here I show some results where uh, you, know, you have two images, a horse and a plane. On the left is the original image. Uh, and on the right, the, the last two columns are two quantiles that were learned directly as part of the uh, or learning to discriminate the images. The only difference is that on the SVD column, we just said optimize the, the quantile uh, without asking it to be quantile, just asking optimize uh, F as a, as a vector. And the last column is optimize F so that it's increasing, so that we can interpret that as quantile normalization, because a quantile is a, is a vector that is increasing. Okay? And so more or less what it seems to be learning here, if you put no constraint, is strangely, I mean, it's not strange, but it learns you know, to transform the black and white values into black and white values. But basically, uh, the, the, the new white values corresponds to some area of gray, which on the images turn out to be the the, the values that transitions between dark and light positions. And so it looks like somehow some edge detector, very naive one, but if you give the, the method the possibility to optimize F, it converges to somehow an edge detector. Uh, if you constrain F to be increasing so that you can really interpret that as, as you know, uh, some, some form of histogram normalization, then it does some form of uh, quantization of the pixels. And so here, this is the F learned. And when you look at the picture, you see that it decides just to quantify the pixels into four values. So it's very far away from uniform. But it's just, of course, when you, you, know, uh, when you impose F to be uniform, maybe it's, it's, it's good for your eyes to visualize details, etc. But here, the, 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 the machine considered that it was better just to, uh, to quantify in, into three or four values in order to discriminate easily planes for hor from horses. Okay, so it's just one more degree of freedom, and it seems to be learning things which give you some slight advantage in performance and seem to make sense. Okay, uh, that was one possibility. Now let me quickly jump to another one. So uh, here basically you understand that uh, in this idea of, of quantile normalization and supervised quantile normalization, at the end of the day what we did is we, we, uh, we transformed this permutation into this binary matrix and then this is the starting point for a matrix linear model. Uh, if you make a linear model on this matrix, very quickly you see that it's nice, but the types of information that are captured here are just based on coordinates ij's of this matrix. So you would have ways, for, for example, if some item, some particular bottle of wine, is ranked at some particular position. And maybe you may want to enrich descriptors to add additional information. Like, for example, a good, a good information would be, did this person prefer wine 2 compared to wine 4. And this is hard to capture with this representation. It's not explicitly encoded in this, in this thing. So you may imagine other things like this one, which is another representation of a permutation as a matrix, uh, where you see many more ones. Because here I put a one if and only if, uh, at position ij, if and only the item i is ranked before item j. Okay, so you, you can, you know, from the other matrix, you can build that one and conversely, but at least here, there are directly features. Imagine doing a linear model on that. You could have a weight associated to the fact that some, someone prefers this one compared to that one, and this could be a good feature to, to learn whatever uh, you want to learn. So that's another representation, and I call that the Kendall representation. Uh, for, the, for the following reason, if you think of it, you can study a bit what, what happens. So when you embed all permutations, you end up with a you know, vector space of permutations. And this particular vector space has some nice properties. One of them is that if you take two permutations, so they are mapped to two vectors, if you compute the inner product, then you have a simple formula to, to, to look at, and, and the formula tells you that the inner product between two permutations after this embedding is exactly what's called the number of concordant pairs, meaning the number of pairs of items which are ranked in the same relative ordering in the two permutations. Right? And conversely, if you take two vectors, you take the square distance in the embedding, then it's up to a factor two, the number of discordant pairs, so the number of, of pairs of items which are ranked in opposite directions between the two permutations. So this was uh, studied by uh, Yunlong Zhao, a student of mine, 
And a, a consequence of that, so not for deep learning, but for canon methods, is that if you take the number of con concordant pairs, and this thing up to scanning is also called the Kendall tau in statistics. It's one of the best known uh, correlation measures between permutation. This Kendall tau is exactly up to you know multiplication and addition, exact uh, equal to this inner product. So it shows that in particular it's, it's a valid kernel and can be used uh, to do machine learning with kernels uh, on permutations. And similarly, because the you know the distance, the number of discordant pairs is, is the square distance, then you can uh, the, the Gaussian kernel in this, in this feature space is simply exponential minus when you have two permutation exponential minus the number of discordant pairs between two permutations, and it's a valid kernel as well. Uh, sometimes it's called the Maddow's kernel in, in statistics, but here we, we can see it as the Gaussian kernel in, in some feature space. So you can we can safely use that with uh, kernel methods. And a good property is that both of them can be computed efficiently because it's based on sorting. It's well known that the co computing the, the number of, of concordant pairs takes n log n, even though it's an inner product in n square dimensions. Okay, maybe I will uh, skip that, but just to say that. There, there, there was some other work, in particular Rishi Kondor works a lot on this thing, and, 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 and at some point he proposed something called a diffusion kernel over the Cayley's graph. I don't have time to explain, but uh, what, what we call the Malos kernel is very similar. It's just exponential of, of minus the shortest path distance on this graph, and it's fast to compute, it's n log n. Whereas if you do diffusion on it, which was what uh, Kondor proposed, it takes time n to the n. So there is a huge difference in speed. Uh, in, in, com in complexity of computing something that looks similar, and it's a, a you know strange phenomenon that here the shortest path distance on this graph turns out to be a valid kernel. I close the parenthesis. Okay, so uh, let me uh, in in the last uh, minute uh, uh, try to extend a bit that and say you know the so we have recovered that the candle tau correlation is a valid kernel. M what about thinking of weighted versions of the candle tau? and how they could be related to this feature space embedding. So by, by weighted version, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, when you compute the number of concordant pairs, it's nice, but sometimes when you want to compare rankings, you, you, may, you may want to give more weights, for example, to items which are near the top of the list. It's very well known if you, you know, study search engines or preferences. Maybe when you have a long list of items, the top of the list is important, the bottom is less important. So instead of computing a global correlation based on all pairs, what about weighting differently items based on their ranks in the list? Uh, many people have worked on that and proposed weighted versions of Kendall store, but none of them, if you look at them closely, is a valid kernel. Like, none of them corresponds to an inner product in some embedding in a space for various reasons. Some are not symmetric, some are not positive definite, etc. So our question here is, could we change the embedding so that the inner product, instead of being the candle tower, becomes a weighted version and maybe uh, gives us a way to optimize the weights? So this is something we, we worked on recently. And basically, when you try to, to think of it, it's not complicated. It's very easy to, to propose something. And for example, uh, if you look at the corollary here, uh, as soon as you define a, a matrix U that would be a square matrix with weights, so you would you know, you would be a square matrix where basically uij would be a way to decide to weight a pair which is ranked uh, at positions i and j. And so you say when you, for example, when you count the number of concordant pairs, uh, you know, each, each pair, if it's concordant, contributes something, and in, in this definition, it would contribute uh, something depending on u, uh, uij, if the items are ranked in position i and j, each of them. Okay, so this thing turns out to be a valid positive definite kernel. It's, it's easy to show, and so it means that uh, this weighted uh, function, which is parameterized by u, corresponds to some embedding where the inner product becomes some weighted uh, weighted candle tau correlation. You can think of various ways to weigh. So I said maybe you can just uh, count pairs just when they are in the top k items for some k, like in the top ten items. Or you could have some decreasing weights with the with the rank, etc. So there are many. Uh, it's a very general setting, and, and in many cases you still you still keep the computational uh, benefits of being able to have fast uh, computation when you make the inner product. And uh, let me just now focus on on, on this. We almost by uh, the end. Uh, so I said that wh when you define a matrix U that gives you weights, then it corresponds to some embedding. And here I write phi U of sigma, which is 
this embedding that gives the weighted candle as, as correlation. So it's simply, again, a matrix, n by n matrix, what position ij, you, you again have one or zero, but the one is multiplied by a weight that depends on you. Okay, this is the new embedding, and when you have two sigmas, you do the inner product, then the inner product is a weighted candle tau. Now, if you look closely at this, you can do some math here, and skipping the details, uh, you know, a bit like in the first part on, on Suquan, I said, can we explicit what phi of sigma is in terms of f? And I said, yes, we can, and, and phi of sigma was this matrix pi multiplied by f. So here we can do the same and show that phi u of sigma, you see again this matrix pi is the same matrix pi as before, so it's the same mat binary matrix uh, which, which was one at position ij if uh, i is sigma of j. And so here, if you look closely, then, then this new representation is just the matrix u multiplied on the right and on the left by the matrix pi. So pi on the right, pi transpose on the left. Okay, it's just easy to check. And so if you play the same game as before and say, suppose you do this transformation, so you, you map your data to this feature space, and then you make a linear model in this feature space, it means that you need to compute some inner product between a vector of weight beta and your new representation, phi of sigma. And because phi of sigma is pi transpose u pi, you can play a bit with that. And what you end up with, exactly as before, the, the first part, but in, in some more uh, bigger space, is that the, the, a linear function over this mapping can be seen as a linear function over big matrices, so we can call that tensor or big, big matrices, it's n square by n square matrices, where a sigma now is represented not as pi sigma, but as pi sigma uh, tensor product itself. So don't be scared by this object, I don't have time to explain, but it's just an n square by n square matrix where each coordinate is indexed by ij, so we have ij, k, l, and there is a one if and only if sigma of i is k and sigma of j is l. So conceptually, I mean, it's a, it's a big but simple object. And so here what we, you know, the, the take home message is that learning in these embeddings amounts to training a linear model in a bigger space where now a permutation is represented by your n square by n square matrix. And uh, you make an inner product again by a rank one tensor, right? It's a matrix multiplied by matrix where one of the matrices is the weight you learn habitually, so it's, it's just the weight of the linear model, and the other matrix was, is the weight u, is the matrix u that defined the weighted candle. Okay? So just like before, you could say either I fix u because I want to focus my comparison to the top 10 items, and this defines the u, or you could say u now is a parameter, and I leave it free and I optimize, and you see optimization here is hidden in the joint optimization of u and beta, uh, there is a complete symmetry between u and beta, so instead of fixing u, optimizing beta, you can just optimize u and beta together, and therefore learn some optimal weights in the weight in, weighted correlation defined by Kendall uh, that would optimize some criterion to discriminate uh, uh, classes, for example. Right, so I think uh, uh, I will not uh, talk about the details, but so we, we tried that on very small data sets, like we took examples a bit like that, but on rankings of, of six sources of information. It's, toy, it's a toy application, the, just to check if, you know, if Im implementation worked and if it gives something. So it's possible to implement it. At least we have, we didn't work, but it's still quite recent. So we just have navy implementation that work when you rank six items, but will not work if you rank, let's say, a thousand items yet. Uh, you have to think a bit about scalability, etc. But at least, uh, in some cases, you get some benefit in optimizing the, the, the weights as opposed to not waiting, for example, to, to, you know, to just use the candle toe as, as kernel, then a weighted candle is better and, and it's, it's, it's slightly better if you optimize the weights together with the, with the SVM in this case. Uh, and again, it's a bit, I mean, to, once you have optimized the weights, you can look at them a bit like before I showed on images what, what uh, quantile had been learned. Here again, you can look at the weights and you can, you know, there is no big message here, but it shows you how, for example, uh, the, uh, what's the contribution when you observe that someone has ranked uh, someone at position five compared to position three. It gives you some weights that contribute to the number of concordant pairs, which are in these matrices. And so in this case, you can maybe analyze the matrix to get some intuition about what's going on, like the fact that the top three items are quite similar and suddenly there's a big gap between three and four. This is the kind of thing that come out from that. But typically this is uh, an illustration of 
the fact that it's possible at least to to formalize the optimization of the weights uh, and, and to plug that into s the, the global learning, which which is uh, reminiscent of you know all these uh, uh, embeddings which are learned uh, together with the with the thing. Uh, I will just conclude by saying that maybe for those of you who have you know background in algebra, you know some some of them are, you may have noticed that I spoke of the permutation embedding uh, of the permutation embedding tensor itself. So all these things are part of what's called representations of the symmetric group. It's a big topic. In fact, there is, I mean, there is nothing very new in what I said. In fact, we know that there is something called the Bochner theorem, well known for, uh, you know, uh, to, to define what are the positive definite kernels for vectors. But if you apply the Bochner theorem on the symmetry group, it tells you that all possible embeddings, which are right invariant, in fact, can be obtained by mapping the sigmas to things which are called representation of the symmetry group. And so, my two examples were two representations, but we have the full list of our representations, right? And, and you can very easily, at least conceptually, consider other embeddings by just taking the list of um, representations, which are uh, known uh, by uh, uh, people working on uh, discrete groups. Uh, and so this defines the, the whole set of embeddings which satisfy the property that they are right invariant, which, we, which was what I wanted at the beginning. Right, so uh, I'm sorry I was a bit long, but in short, uh, this was just an illustration uh, of an attempt to, you know, to generalize these ideas of learning over objects, which are not only vectors or strings or graphs. So there are many other objects, you know, uh, I talked of groups. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine many other things with particular symmetries or operations. Uh, and, and in our case, it was possible to study a bit systematically how to embed at least permutations under the constraint that you want some right invariant embedding, which is something that made sense if you want to be invariant by relabeling of your uh, initial items. Um, all these things, at least conceptually, are compatible with deep learning, like this could be put at, as the first layer, I mean, these are two sums, but you can also imagine, you know, people in deep learning, I'm not really working on deep learning, but I hear that uh, people are, it seems that normalization seems to play a big role, even at different layers. Uh, this is a particular normalization, you think of it. You know, I said I have an image, I strike the ranking, I do something. So you can maybe imagine that possibility uh, is to, at different layers, to convert the outputs to some just extracting the ranking and instead of just doing the scaling, for example, just doing a full quantile normalization, etc. And this can be optimized. Uh, but of course, what I did not talk much about is, uh, if you want to do that, maybe we have to, to think of scalable uh, ways to attack the problem. I don't know if we need random features or other ways to express the thing. For the moment, as soon as you want to capture information, which is like uh, comparing uh, positions of two items or triplets of items, then you have an explosion in the dimensions of my embeddings. So certainly if you want to work efficiently in them, uh, there is work to try to, uh, to, to reduce this to, to manageable dimensions. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. how we can use it to reduce the computational cost. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you could say, let's apply the recipe of random Fourier features to this. Uh, it will not be scalable because, you know, in random Fourier features for vectors, you just sample uh, omega, yeah. right? And then you have a feature, so it's just one thing. Now, here the equivalent, as you probably know, are uh, the, the different um, uh, basic uh, representations, which are matrices of varying size. So one omega becomes here a big matrix, right? And so as soon as you have one omega, instead of computing the sine of omega x plus b, uh, you need to compute typically a n square by n square in a product. So one omega would be a big matrix. And so the direct application of random features is not interesting. Now, how to replace that by something that would be, for example, a compressed representation or projection of this matrix. Maybe it's possible, but you know, this is uh, work to be done. I don't know. 
Thank you for your interesting talk. So my question is about your first part. So you said that you import some structure for the app. Yep. Uh, so I would like to ask how you can talk the the increasing of app inside your customization. Uh, maybe I have something on that. Well, we just um, so yeah, uh, we we just write down that you know uh, so f so to optimize f and w and b there is a big optimization problem, okay, and then to enforce something we just say optimize this subject to the constraint that f is increasing. So this is what what I wrote here subject that f uh, is in the set such that f one is more than f two etc. And, and you know this is a convex uh, constraint. So what we do? So I said you know we optimize we alternate optimization on the right and on the left. And so in this case, when we fix W optimizing f, it becomes just you know an optimization over f over vectors subject to a convex constraint. So we just use standard method for that. And in particular, so the we use a proximal gradient here, and and the proximity operator over the set of increasing f is very fast to compute. Thank you.